great weekend, and it's it's good to be together. And just like us to uh, just open in prayer. Um, Father God, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we can come together to worship you, to learn of you, and, and God, to be challenged in our, our own walks with you so that we can be a light, uh, Lord, not only to our families but to the community that we're in. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we ask now that you would just be glorified as we sing familiar songs to you, Lord, that we would just lift up our hearts and that you would, that you'd speak to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's worship. Go ahead and take a uh, Stand up, not take a seat. Stand up. <laughs> Behold the star of Bethlehem, the word of God has become flesh unto us. A child is born, the Savior of this broken world. Oh, hear the angel voices. Sing, come, let us adore him. Peace has come, for our King is with us. Holy God and fully man, he comes for all with open hands. He rules with love on David's throne. All praise belongs to Christ alone. Oh, hear, oh, hear the angel voices. Come, let us adore him. Peace has come, for our King is with us. Holy, 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 Jesus, we adore thee. Holy, 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 Jesus, we adore thee. Peace has come, for our King is with us. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Him, Christ the Lord. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Oh, hear the angel voices. Sing, come, let us adore him. Oh, hear the angel voices. Sing, come, let us adore him. Peace has come, our King is with us. Peace has come, for our King is with us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, that you came. Lord, that you lived a perfect life. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for your death. Lord, if you did not come, you would not have died for us. And we are here to celebrate that, Lord, our salvation and the sacrifice that you made for us. God, so we are so incredibly thankful for that. God, I pray that you would just uh, bless us this morning and create hearts of worship within us, that we would just praise you for who you are this morning. Thank you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We we'll just have a few announcements to go over quickly.
In your bulletins, you've got a couple of inserts. One of them is for a La Posada uh, <laughs> celebration. Lots of food and fellowship and going out into the community. Oh, we're going to meet at Eden, Enid's place. I think that's the address here. Starts at 6 o'clock, so um, if you're hungry and uh, if you're really convinced, and if you're really convicted by the message this morning about having <laughs> relationships and fellowship and stuff, then this is great. Great way to practice it starting off. All right. That's a um, precursor to secondly, the message. <laughs> secondly, notice in there there's this um, other insert talking about the listeningplan.com. And uh, it's, it's a thing you can put on your – you can get an email uh, once a day uh, for the weekdays. Uh, there's 260 uh, chapters, I believe, in the New Testament, and there's 260 weekdays for 2016. So every weekday, Monday through Friday, you can have in your inbox a link to a devotion uh, where you can listen to a portion of the Scripture, you can read different devotionals, uh, you can have time to think about how those things apply in your life, and uh, we all need this. Um, not, not just this plan, but we all need to be in the Word, and this is just a tool uh, to help you in your devotional life for 2016. And you can test it out early, and, and I think you'll enjoy it. It was put together by the young man that I turned my church over to about eight years ago at Calvary Chapel Escondido. Yeah, Miles put this together. Yeah, he was one of my Bible college teachers. There you go. Yeah, He's see a good the, the guy. Link. We got linkage all over the place here. Yeah, so... Yeah, Miles is uh, just uh, has a great heart, and he's got a great gift with the, the geeky techy stuff, and uh, and he can make it easy. So you can just click and listen and grow. Uh, not that it's easy to grow. How many agree with it's not real easy to grow, but but you can be fertilized. <laughs> you know, the Lord can put the uh, put the put the juice on you, the stuff that you need to to help you to grow in your daily walks with Jesus and your, our walks with one another. Lots of different kinds of fertilizer. Yes, there is. Yes, thank you. I'm... Never mind. We won't go there. There's... <laughs> All right. Um, the living water. Living water. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Lord, pour, pour, the, pour the water on us, the water of your word, Lord. Uh, a couple of the studies that normally meet every week are going to be on break for the holidays, so please note that in your bulletin. Christmas Eve Eve is this Wednesday, um, and uh, we invite you out. Uh, it's going to be out in the shed, and they're going to. It's going to be just a wonderful time of worshiping the Lord, remembering what Jesus came to do for us and for our community, and we hope you can be a part of that. So, am I missing anything on? That besides Mike's enthusiasm for Christmas Eve, Eve, right? Did I do that right? Okay. Thank you, Lord. I want to also thank the Lord for answers answers to prayer. Um, you know, we've we've got a lot of them we could probably share, but you know, last week we prayed for Alicia, and uh, she had thrown her back out and was in a tremendous amount of pain. Had to go to the ER, and. Uh, here she is this I'm morning. Here. So the Lord is Praise faithful Lord. to to get her through that. So thank you. And now in turn, Mike's got a really lousy cold. Anybody else got sniffles and things you're dealing with? Oh, let's pray for one another right now, could we? <laughs> could we? Father God, we just thank you for your work in our lives. And Lord, we just pray for the physical health of the body, Lord. Um, for Mike and those others that are battling things. Uh, Lord, we, we just ask for your healing. Uh, we, we ask that you would, even in the midst of going through the, the lousiness of colds, that you would overwhelm each one with your joy. Uh, Lord, fill them with your peace and bring healing to their bodies, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, there are some, last, if you need last-minute Christmas gifts, there's stuff outside from the women's ministry. And probably most importantly, as a little fundraiser for the youth ministry, four delicious chocolate chip cookies for a buck. And the buck goes to help the kids with the different things that they're going to be doing and camps and so youth forth. Camp. So youth camp coming up. Youth camp. And uh, these, are, these are guaranteed to be non-gluten-free, okay? So these are the real deal, okay? They're gluten-free. Mm. Are they gluten-free or non-gluten? They're non-gluten, non man. These are just serious chocolate chip cookies. 
Thank you, Mia. <laughs> what are they, raisins? They're cookies, right, Ethan. <laughs> Oatmeal raisin cookies, non-gluten, the best. Thank you. Right. What we're going to do, <laughs> as I gather myself, I'll leave this here. This past Thanksgiving, we had a great time at Copper Sky. How many of you were involved with that? Got a chance to reach out to our community and love on them. So Mike has put together a little video um, just to, with some pictures to remind us of what happened. Kathy's going to be sharing a testimony, and Gia's going to come on up right after that. And then we'll continue with worship. So let's do it, Alan. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Merry Christmas. Um, I had an incredible experience at, at this Thanksgiving dinner, and I was asked to share it. And um, uh, going into this um, actually was a little different. Last year, we went to a children's charity in Phoenix where you stuff boxes, and we actually broke records, um, and so that was kind of neat. Um, but I wanted more of a personal touch this year for Sterling, my granddaughter, and myself. I wanted to be able to relate to the people that we were serving. And um, that also um, brings up the definition of service, and the obvious one when you're servicing people is to provide for their needs. Um, however, in, in this situation, I wanted to use God's definition of service, and that is really touching the hearts of others and bringing God into the relationship. Um, so going into it, I prayed that I'd have a family with kids at my table. And um, sure enough, they walked in and sat down, and there were four kids, five-year-old little girl, a 10-year-old boy, a 12-year-old boy who was a little bit challenged, and a 16-year-old girl, no mother, and the father. So um, I immediately introduced myself, and I told them a little bit about, about myself because I wanted to relate to the fact that I'm in the same situation they are and um, that everybody suffers from hardships of some kind um, all the time. And so I shared that my daughter was in prison right now and um, that I'm raising Sterling, the, my nine-year-old grandchild. And um, I'm also on access and I lost my husband seven years ago and just wanted to kind of relate to them so that they would open up a little bit more. And um, it, it, it really helped <laughs> because as I'm um, serving the first plate, the little five-year-old turns around and she just goes like this and just grabs me and gives me a really big hug. And then every single time I served, I don't care if it was 
um, a cup of coffee or a meal or whatever, I got these just so grateful thank yous from these kids. And it, they just really touched me. And so I'd linger around and talk to them and, and just kind of bring up little things about uh, God. And, and then we had this movie that was showing testimonies of several different people. Well, we probably didn't think about the little kids because these testimonies were pretty heavy duty. And so I went over to my table, scooped up the little girl, put her on my lap, and then I took the 12 year old, because he's you know, a little bit challenged, and I got their attention off it because there was a lot of violence in it. But the message obviously was that these people found God and through God and their faith, they made it through their hardships. So the 10 year old turned to me and said, what is that on the screen? You know, what are we watching? So I was able to share that with him and, and tell him that you know, through God, we can get through all of our problems. And so anyway, um, <laughs> the 16 year old spilt the hot chocolate all over the 12 year old. It could have turned into a really catastrophe, um, but it, it didn't. And um, another thank you, Lord. And um, I just started, you know, hanging around. Well, the, the little girl looked at me and I suddenly remembered that I had something in my car. And just back up a little bit, when I lost my husband seven years ago and I came to the point where I had to let go of his things, I wanted to do it in a significant way. I just couldn't go to Goodwill and just give them. So I made eight bags. Each bag had a pair of tennis, dress shoes, um, jeans, sweatshirt, uh, several t-shirts, a suit, um, and, and anything like that, all eight bags. And so my, my goal was that when I, when I got that light, uh, that that person was somebody I wanted to gift a bag to, I got out of the car, explained the situation, and gave it to him. That way I received his gratefulness immediately and it just it made it made the giving away much less painful so it was so so meaningful that i decided to always have something in my car for men women household and kids those are the four categories so unbeknownst to this thanksgiving dinner i had just put in size six just size six, clothes for a little girl in one big bag. I had one of women and I had a household one. So as I'm sitting at that table with this little girl on my lap, it suddenly dawns on me, whoa, I've got this bag of clothes. I, I don't want to step on their toes, but I should offer it. And so I did, and of course he said yes. And so then I didn't say anything about the other stuff because I thought it might be a little bit overwhelming. So I said, can I walk out to my, your car with you? So I did, and I gave him the bag, and then I gave the 16-year-old girl the women's bag, and I gave the father the household bag. And oh my God, there were just tears everywhere. Everybody's hugging, and you know, I, I, I had that desire to know what would happen afterwards, and maybe I will meet them again someday, but the point was, that moment was so precious and they were so grateful and it was so much more than just serving and I really felt that uh, God was flowing through all of us in, in that. So I just wanted to share it, share that. So Merry Christmas. And just to, um, good morning, hi, <laughs> to you. Um, and just to kind of preface her story um, real quick, um, the family that came um, to the event that evening, the family that she got to serve, um, her uh, partner in that for serving was um, Tim Mogan. And Tim, it was really cool because when the Lord had put it on our hearts to go and do this again for this year, and we're going to go sign up, do the sign ups at the food bank, and and talk with people and and invite people, um, you know, the Lord put it on our hearts to invite some of the men to come and join us for that time. So Robert Horton and Tim Mogan came out that first morning. We did it on Monday, 
and um, he, he, he had shared with me, he had sent an email to share with you guys. He said, it, you know, coming out of his comfort zone, it was, a, it was a challenge for him, you know, but God just encouraged his heart and gave him the strength to go do that. So it was a real stepping out of his comfort zone to go out and, and you know, and, and encourage and, and talk to those people um, for him. But anyways, he had met up with the gentleman. He had never, the gen this gentleman had never come to our table. So he um, kind of went out and he saw him go put his stuff in his car and then kind of chased him out there and kind of followed him and said, hey, you know, this is what we're doing, shared with him and invited that dad to come and sign up. And so he, that was just a divine appointment for that family to be there and for you and Tim to be partnered up to team. I mean, I, it blows my mind. Her story just touched my heart. I was in tears when I read it and I was like, you've got, we've got to share this. So amazing. So, um, yeah, so it was awesome that, um, that they could be um, uh, put together in, in that situation and just pour out God's love. So anyways, I just want to again thank all of you that helped support your prayers, um, financial support, um, and just those of you that served and came out. Um, we had a lot of team that put together food and baked things. So again, it was just an amazing opportunity to just show God's love to those precious people. And we have such a great relationship with the food bank, Wendy Webb and, and her team. So if any of you are ever interested in doing further oper um, serving opportunities, we have a couple people that do that here. And you can always just go to their website, and um, I can have a little thing out there, and just different opportunities to serve these families and, and serve at the food bank on a year-round basis if you'd like to do that. So anyways, again, thank you for all your support. Thank you for your prayers. And just thank you for how you come together and you share the love of Christ and pour out to these precious people in our community. Amen. So thank you. Continue the good work in Amen. the Lord. Thanks, thank Gia. You. Okay, why don't, we, uh, why don't we all stand and, uh, and mingle. <laughs> And mingle a little bit, all right? Greet some of the folks around you. If you don't know somebody, ask, who are you? And are you? what are you doing here? Good Did you think that was a chocolate chip? You know what? I'm so bad. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. Sorrow grow, no thorns in the crown. He comes to make his blessings flow. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world. Truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love, and wonders of His love, and wonders, wonders of His love. Joy to the world. Lord is come, let earth receive a king, let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and 
nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Go ahead and take a seat. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing. The baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me I pray bless all the dear children in thy tender care and take us to heaven to live with thee there bless all children in thy tender care and take us to heaven to live with thee there and take us to heaven to live with thee
Jesus, God, we just thank you, Lord, that you, Lord, you came. <laughs> I just, I can't get over that you chose us. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for the, the life that you, you sacrificed for us, God, your life. Lord, the creator of the universe, the, the universe died for us, and you came as a baby, Lord, to, to show us what life should be like, Lord, how we should live. Lord, you were the best example, and we are so thankful for that. God, I pray that you would just fill Pastor Pat to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, that the words that he would say this morning would just permeate our very beings, God, and that we would just um, become more like you, Jesus. God, we, we thank you. I, I pray that his words would be your words, God, and our hearts would be just released up to you, God that we would just have pliable spirits and pliable hearts so you can make us into what you want to, which is a masterpiece, God. We are so thankful for that. It's in uh, your name we pray. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. It's beautiful. As we were uh, worshiping to a very, tr very familiar song, it's kind of amazing that we would, that, that I sang that chorus over and over again growing up and just had very little clue of the impact of the truth. Christ our Savior, Jesus Lord at your birth. It's powerful. Um, also, as I was sitting back there, I was just um, thinking how grateful, how grateful I am to be able to be a small part of you guys during this season of transition. I'm, I'm grateful that the Lord 
uh, allowed me to come to Maricopa and to be with you all. And all of you high schoolers and junior hires are leaving right now. <laughs> Not because you don't like me, but just because, you know. Bless you guys. Have fun. All right. Praise the Lord. So the Lord is good, isn't he? Yes, he is. Um, Linda needs a Bible. Anybody else need a Bible? Put your hand up, and we'll deliver one right to your chair. Yeah, great. And we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But again, I, I was just very thankful and grateful for uh, the friendships that are developing. Um, if there's anything that's difficult about being a transitional senior pastor, it's that you get close to people and people start getting close to you. And uh, though that might be a little difficult in having to then go through another transition, um, I want you to know it's just a real honor to be able to share with you in God's word and hopefully encourage you through this time and uh, together we'll be praying for God's will to be done and, and God's plan. So um, uh, we are um, putting into place some things that have been needed um, as far as the leadership of the church goes. Some of you know may know that um, uh, when Pastor Chris planted the church here, he had some very supportive and helpful brothers along with him that would pray and guide him uh, as he was leading the church. And these brothers were at different churches. Uh, one was in Phoenix, one's in Colorado, and another was you know, on the East Coast. And uh, that was the board of directors for Calvary Chapel, Maricopa. Um, and uh, those brothers have uh, made it known to me that they're fine with stepping down and letting local leadership raise up. So that's what I would like to have you be praying for. I'm pretty sure what that board is going to look like, but um, we need prayer for that, and they are going to be all men that are part of this church um, so that when we start having to make some of those decisions regarding who we're going to be bringing and the interview process and all of that, that we've got our guys that are going to be helping me um, with it. So I would ask you to please pray for that. We'll probably announce to you in a couple of weeks who those guys are and have you pray for them. And uh, or I'm already starting to get emails and calls and stuff from other other guys who either have somebody on staff or somebody that is just coming back from the mission field or somebody who's in between churches. So uh, I think we're going to have a lot to sort through, a lot to pray through. Um, we don't want to just be real quick. At, like Clark said to me the second day I met him, so have you found us a pastor yet? <laughs> I don't even know. Who are you? <laughs> How many of you know it takes time to get to know people? It takes time to build relationships. And, uh, and that's what we want to talk about this morning as we go into the, uh, Second Timothy, as we continue in Chapter 4. We want to talk about things that matter. We've been dealing with that subject. And uh, today we want to talk about how relationships matter. And uh, I, I'm grateful for uh, Kathy sharing her testimony um, and uh, Tim's that he shared with Gia. Uh, you know, we are, this is what we are about as Christians. We are about building relationships with people because Jesus poured himself out so that we could have relationship with him. But we've learned over and over again that we've been blessed to be a blessing. The good things that God gives us, he gives them to us, not for us to just hoard, but to thank you, Lord, share and give out to others and help. And uh, and that's that's a great gift that we have. So would you pray with me as we get into our study this morning? Father, give us ears to hear what you would say to your church today. Lord, um, just as uh, Alicia prayed, Lord, that it wouldn't be, wouldn't be my words and, and my ideas, Lord. Um, oh, you know, I've gotten full of that. Um, but Lord, that 
your words would speak to my heart and this congregation's heart. And Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would make application of these truths into our, our hearts and our lives. Lord, thank you for the, your faithfulness in, in continuing to teach us and lead us and guide us in your ways. And so we pray now that you would open up our understanding and challenge our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in um, chapter 4, um, this, is, this is the finale um, for, for Paul, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. He is giving final instructions to uh, a young pastor who was sort of a protege of Paul. Uh, Paul had left him in the city of Ephesus, one of the largest uh, powerful centers outside of Rome that represented the Roman Empire, uh, a city that was filled with idolatry, the worship of Diana, the goddess Diana. A massive stadium was built for, for her worship, and that, that amphitheater is still there today. In fact, I'm told on our last trip to Israel that there are actually... There have been concerts in that amphitheater because the acoustics were so perfect. And, it's, and, it, and they've uncovered that whole thing, and they're using it. Of course, I think they had to stop them for a while because parts of it were crumbling because of the speakers. I think they had U2 there once. And, you know, it was <laughs> Anyway, um, but this was a crazy city for, for a guy to be pastoring in. Um, and we, as we read through the epistles to Timothy, we see Paul continually encouraging Timothy and challenging Timothy, um, you know, to rise above your own fears, uh, your own doubts, your own um, uh, comforts, if you will. Um, because we get real possessive when it comes to our comforts, don't we? We get real serious about it. I mean, there's certain things that we like, and we get into routines, we get into habits, and if we get out of those routines, well, we start feeling uncomfortable or having a panic attack or whatever. You know, and the Lord would be telling us, as he was telling Timothy, um, I'm greater than all of those fears. God has not given me or you a spirit of fear, but he's given us power and love and a sound, disciplined mind. That's what those are the gifts that God gives us. How many of you need those? You're on, you, you say, man, I got the love, but the power and the sound mind, <laughs> I need a little help there. Or we got the power, but we don't have the love, and that's out of balance too. So, um, so Timothy needed to hear that. And, and, and as Paul was writing this to Timothy, he, he had in mind Timothy then passing it on to others and teaching others. And, uh, and that is the purpose for Calvary Maricopa. We're here to study God's word to grow in it and pass it on to others and to be used however God would want to use us. That can be scary, can be threatening, but we're all called to that. So just to recap, as we look through those first five verses we covered last week, we'll just read through them a little bit. I charge you, therefore, and of course the therefore is there because of perilous times and everything else that he had already spoken of in the epistle. Yeah, whenever you're reading and you come across the therefore, go back. You know, go back, read the chapter before that. Read the paragraph before that. It'll help you get the context. So he's saying because evil men and imposters are going to grow and it's going to be a nasty situation where folks are uh, lovers of themselves and lovers of money and boasters and proud and blasphemers, and it just makes us ill reading through that, that list of things in, in chapter 3. So he says, I charge you, therefore... Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here's what you do in the meantime. While we're waiting for the Lord to come back, here's what you do. Preach the word. Proclaim the word of God. And this is not something just for pastor teachers. It is. But it is certainly for anyone who says, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. You know, Lord, of, are you Lord of me? If you were Lord, you know, at the very beginning of your existence here as a human being, are, are you Lord of my life? When we sing that, we have to ask that. 
And if he is Lord of your life, then who's in charge? <laughs> it's a deafening silence. Because I know we're all thinking that, well, <laughs> we know he should be in charge, but frankly, I'm usually the one that's in charge. And God challenges that. He said, preach the word. And whether you feel like it or not, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, because some people need a sound argument. Rebuke, because some people are just caught in more immorality and they need to be rebuked. And exhort, because sometimes people have a lot of fears and we're to be lifting them up and encouraging them. And how do you do all of that? You do it with long-suffering and teaching, with patience and instruction. And we all need that as we're dealing with the, with the world around us because the time will come. And he's speaking to Christians here. He said the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. Like churches are going to be around that really don't believe Jesus is God in human flesh. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe that this is the infallible, God-breathed word of God to you and I. They don't believe that. And there are whole denominations that get caught up in that. It's, it's the, the spirit of the world. And so the time's going to come when they won't endure sound doctrine. Notice, but according to their own desires... The me generation. It's all about me, and I'm entitled to this and that. And he said it's according to their own desires because they have itching ears. Uh, they want to be stimulated with all kinds of new tricks and things. And, and they're going to heap up for themselves teachers. And they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. And really, it's some are called to be evangelists. Some are called to be pastors, teachers. There's different giftings, but I think every Christian is called to represent the good news of Jesus, every one of us. Our work is to glorify God here and forever. That's what is it, that Westminster Catechism of what is the chief end of man? What, what, what's our purpose? Why are we here? We're here to glorify God and to worship him and praise him forever. That's why we're here. So while we're here, we fulfill our ministry by being available for the Lord to speak through us, love through us, help through us, challenge through us, encourage through us. And I guarantee you, with this group of people right here, we got a lot, of, a lot of issues that need to be encouraged and helped, some that need to be challenged. Certainly all of us need prayer, right? I mean, I do, and I know you do too, but sometimes we don't want to say, would you please pray for me? And then we think, oh, they're going to roll their eyes and go, what drama is he going to lay on me now? You know? But that's what it means being in season and out of season. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Just ask and do it. Go, go for it. And then he gets into it in verse 6. And we're going to look at verses 6, 7, and 8. Um, I thought we might finish the chapter, but I thought wrong. <laughs> um, there's just so much here. And he uses this illustration as he's facing the fact that sentence has been passed by Rome, by Nero, and his fate is set. He's going to be beheaded. He made the choice between crucifixion or beheading. And because he was a Roman citizen, he could make that choice. They would honor that. And so he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. My life is, has been poured out and it's already being poured out. My head may as well be cut off and my blood pouring out. He so said, this is, I poured out my life, and soon I'm going to pour out my blood. For the time of my departure is at hand. Not, notice he didn't say the time of his death. He said the time of his departure. And for the believer, death isn't the end. Actually, for the unbeliever, death isn't the end either. 
you know, truth be known. <laughs> but as believers, we change addresses when we die. We sort of, Ray Stedman called it, um, we graduate when we die. There's, there, there's this sense of, okay, when I'm done, what my kids are going to do with all I've helped them with and given them and taught them, they're on their own now. They're going to have to do it. When you graduate from, from high school, you know, you leave all of your accomplishments. And mostly, a lot of times, you leave a lot of your friends and you go off to college or go off to work. And, there's, and, and that's done. You, and if you succeeded in certain things, you pass the baton to the, next, to the, the, to the sophomores and juniors coming up. You, know, you, you pass it on. And Paul was passing the baton on to Timothy here. And Timothy was to do the same to others. So he said, I'm already being poured out. And this idea of being poured out um, is, is, has with it, 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 it's an imagery that the Jews would know very clearly, people of a Jewish background, that on, on one of the great feast days, they would take a, a vat of wine and they would pour it on the actual altar where the burnt offerings were made. And, the, and it would be just symbolic of, of the redemption that God had promised. You remember back in Exodus when the Passover was going to happen and uh, he told the children of Israel to take a lamb and let all of its blood out and take the blood and sprinkle it on the doorposts and and the lintel, the beam across. Um, and uh, when judgment comes upon Egypt, it'll pass over you. But that blood was poured out of the lamb. And um, it has the idea of a complete giving with no reservation. The liquid is completely emptied from the cup and totally given to God. And so that begs the question for you and me. Okay. How is my life being poured out? Hmm? How, how am I being spent for Jesus? The Greek word is spendo, probably where we get our English idea of spent. But Paul here, as he's, as he's dealing with this, and we'll look at a few sections, other sections in the New Testament where he talks about this, keep in mind that the idea is a complete emptying and a total giving to God of all that we have. How many of you have ever um, read through the devotional, My Utmost for His Highest? Uh, Oswald Chambers, sweet, sweet guy, but boy, intense. And one of his devotions, he wrote this. He said, when the spirit of God has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts. And how many of you have had the love of God shed abroad in your heart? Okay, when that happens, we begin deliberately to identify ourselves with Jesus Christ's interests in other people. And Jesus Christ is interested in every kind of person there is. He's not a respecter of persons. If there's an empty place in people's lives, he wants to fill it with his sacrificial love and redemption and forgiveness that came because God himself took the form of a man being perfect sinless, kind of like that spotless lamb that was sacrificed by Jewish families at Passover. And he was perfect, sinless. And he gave his life freely. You remember the Pharisees gathered around and the scribes around the cross as Jesus was hanging there. And he said, well, you, you said you could do this and that. Why don't you pull, why don't you just deliver yourself off that cross? I think the Lord could have just snapped his, blinked his eyes and judgment would have fallen and the earth would have been reduced to a cinder. I have no doubt that he had that power. But had he done that, obviously we wouldn't be here. Had he not sacrificed his blood Remember in the Garden of Eden, he was praying to the Father and said, Oh, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was coming. Then he said, Yet not my will, but your will be done. And when you fall in love with Jesus, folks, he begins to work in you to fall in love with others. To, to, just as Jesus loved you and was working in your life to bring you to him, you can be absolutely certain that if, you're, if you have people in your sphere of influence 
you're an evangelist. I mean, I'm sorry. God has, God has called you to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at, whatever your family situation is, whatever your job situation is, whatever your education, uh, whatever you do for sports, whatever, wherever you're at, wherever you shop, <laughs> you know, you're a representative. And that's why we study these kind of things because, you know, we, we, it's easy to get filled with everything else but that. Amen? There's so many distractions, so easy to get into these things. But here, Chambers is saying that we have no right in Christian work to be guided by our own affinities. Our own, it's about me and what makes me comfortable. And this is one of the biggest tests of our relationship to Jesus Christ. Your interest in another individual is to be centered in what is Christ's interest in them. I like that. So when I look at my, my kids, my grandkids, my relatives, the folks we're going to be hanging with at Christmas, I need to pray. Lord, what's your interest in them? You know, when you come to church, too, that needs to be your prayer. Are you prayed up before you get here on Sunday morning? Because God's going to speak to you through his word, and you certainly want to have a heart that is receptive to it rather than going, is he done yet? I get that. I understand that. I've sat through a lot of, trust me, a lot of messages. And sometimes our minds just are in other places, especially at Christmas. My gosh, how much more stuff do you all have to do to get ready for Christmas? It's nuts. So are we prepared when we come? You know, I've, I, don't, I don't think I've given this illustration yet, so I'll test it out on you guys. I hope this is clean. A lot of us come to church like this. Feed, feed me. Burp. Burp me, feed me. That's the attitude that we come. All right, I'm coming. You better entertain me, man. Worship better be good, man. Because it's about me and what you do for me. Instead of coming into church like this. How may I serve you, ma'am? How can I help you, brother? How can I pray for you? What do you need? You know, we get involved with people. But how many of you know you need to be prayed up? <laughs> because people can annoy you. Not in this church, I'm sure. Not this service. Nobody here ever gets annoyed at anybody. But it's an occupational hazard for being in a church. <laughs> You do, people rub you the wrong way. And how do you respond to that? When you get rubbed the wrong way, it's immediately a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because it's easy to hide behind what you're annoyed by, right? Or annoyed. You know what I'm talking about. If somebody bugs you. You don't overtly go to them and say, let's have some fellowship. I'd love to talk with you. I want to listen to you. We just want to say, would you please leave? <laughs> don't, don't talk to me, you know? And when I was in Escondido, I mean, I pastored the Calvary Chapel in Escondido for 27 years, and um, some of the guys had a brilliant idea of using community access TV and recording our Sunday mornings and our Wednesday nights and putting it up on cable TV. So all the major cable systems in San Diego um, in prime time on Mondays or Thursdays, had me teaching, which was, a, which was a great honor, and I'm blessed to have been able to do that, but you can't go anywhere, you know, without being noticed. And when you've been in a community for a while, you go into the grocery store to get a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread, and people go, Pastor! And you want to go, no, I just came here. I just want to go home. You know, I mean, that's the flesh. That's my fleshly reaction a lot of times. And the Lord continually challenges that. And said, look, are you being poured out? I was poured out for you. Are you being poured out for what I want to do in somebody else's life? 
And my prayer has been for 40 years. You know, Lord, keep help me to remember this. This is not the first time. I'm sure most of us, it's not the first time we've gone through 2 Timothy. We've read these things before. And then if it's the first time, praise God, it won't be the last time. <laughs> You'll hear about it. But I thank the Holy Spirit for giving this to Paul to inspire this as part of Scripture, that we could grow from it and learn from it. So um, 2 Corinthians twelve fourteen, Paul says, I don't want your money, your things, or your gifts. I want you. I love that. That's a pastor's heart. I want you. God brings us to a place of selflessness where our only motive in serving others is that the will of God would be wrought in their lives, that the will of God would be done in their lives. Man, that sure changes how we look at other people. Lord, that your will would be done in their lives. And it's a tough place to be because our comfort, our ease, our benefit really is not the issue. Jesus' blood was poured out for us. And we have that, this blessed hope now of forgiveness, cleansing, and being with him forever. And in Romans 5.5, 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The love of God has been poured out to us. Why? So that we could pour it out to others. Paul saw himself being poured out for the church. In Philippians, his letter to the Philippians, the church at Philippi, uh, chapter 2, verse 17, he said, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Powerful. So Paul had learned to live sacramentally as broken bread and poured out wine. And again, quoting from Oswald Chambers, so that Jesus Christ can help himself to my life at any moment for any purpose. Ooh, that's radical. It's a radical impact on how we live day to day, doesn't it? You know, we hear a lot in the news today about... Um, uh, Islamic uh, radicalism, right? And those that have been of the Muslim faith that have been radicalized. And their idea of radicalization is Sharia law, and anybody who doesn't go with it, they die. And it is very violent and very bloody. I love how the church is called to be radicalized as well. But we don't kill people. We love people. It's a massive difference. Because when we do, when we are, are obedient to the Lord and letting him work in our lives, then his word is going to be coming alive in other people. And lives are going to be changed for the glory of God, for his honor. And we know how that looks as we go through the scriptures. We know what that looks like. When it talks about how we correct one another, we don't chop off their hand, but in humility. We correct one another. We correct those who are in opposition because maybe God will bring repentance to them. The end of chapter 2 of Second Timothy. And they might escape the snare of the devil. So we're not there to, to chop people's arms and heads and other appendages off. You know, we're, we're here to love them because Jesus was poured out for us. Jesus gave himself for us. Almighty God became a man and gave himself for us. And now we have relationship with him. I guarantee you, those that follow Islam do not have a personal relationship with Allah. Allah is beyond a personal relationship. Allah is the law. Allah is what matters. You don't have a, hu a huggy, warm, fuzzy relationship. And you see the end of it. But what happens when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? How does he change you? How does he love you? How is he patient with you? How does he work through you? I mean, it's radically different. I want to be radicalized for Jesus, where he can pour me out when he wants to. You know, when you invite somebody over, like, you know, you, you, you got guests, family coming in, and you're going to go out, and you say, help yourself. You know, whatever you need. Go ahead, open cabinets. I don't care. Whatever you need, just help yourself. Be at home. Well, that's kind of what we want to say to the Lord. Lord, 
Help yourself. Help yourself to my head. Help yourself to my heart. Help, help, help yourself to my lips, my hands, my feet. Help, help yourself and, and work through me as, as you would desire, Lord, as you would desire. Paul, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, and I'll very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. In other words, in your relationship, in, your, in relation to your sphere of Christian testimony, whatever that is, people, your time, your strength, your interests, everything is absolutely at the disposal of others. That's the way we are. We are others-centered centered people. It's not about us. It's about the world that we're in. God so loved the world. Well, we're in the world. Is it worldly around you? Your neighborhood, where you work, whatever? I mean, unless you live in a cave somewhere and you, you who knows why you would be here, but <laughs> because you get exposed to the world. Just getting here. Am I absolutely at the disposal of others? We're taught that in Philippians and in Romans. Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Boy, that's a great verse for, for peace in marriages. I don't know if you've ever been through a tense situation in a marriage. But husbands and wives can get to a place where at the altar they said, I love you forever. And then years later, they're sitting in the pastor's counseling office ready to set off nuclear bombs under each other. You go, how that happened? How that happened? But it's very easy to, to get all offended and go, well, they must not love me because blah, 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 blah. But it's, it, boy, I'll tell you, folks, if you're sitting around waiting for other people to love you, It's not real fruitful. But if you want to experience real love, like Kathy was sharing earlier, prepare yourself, prepare your mind, prepare your car, uh, prepare whatever you need to do to be available for God to do something miraculous, for God to do something special in somebody, somebody's life. I was talking to another brother this morning at the first service, and he's an airline steward, and Boy, people can be, I mean, people can be nasty anyway on a normal flight. But with the pressure of the holidays, you know, he said, oh, God was so good to me. One of the other attendants was a believer, too, and we really needed to pray for each other. You know, because it can get just terrible. But any time in the world, it can get terrible. It is terrible. And we need men and women who are committed to, in lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than themselves. And in, and in case that didn't sink in, I'll give you one more. <laughs> Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. And I'll tell you, when you learn to do that, there is a great outpouring of peace, of wisdom, you know, of discernment. How many of you open your mouth and that's just like pouring gasoline on the problem? Eh? You know what I mean? Why would you do that? And then that just blows something. And guys, no, don't do that. Don't get into an argument with your wife. You lose. You're always going to lose. Because she's got a file cabinet on you, man. And at any second, she can open that and go, blip, blip, blip. And you go, where'd that come from? Where'd that come from? And it's because you opened your yap. Don't open it. Die to yourself. <laughs> People are poking each other. Try it. It works. Trust me, it works. It works. We get in so much trouble. We get in so much trouble. So, folks, relationships matter. Relationships matter. Your family relationships matter. Yes, how Jesus is working in your family. Your relationships together as brothers and sisters in this church, it matters. It's vital. And I pray that we all can say this with Paul in verse 7. You know, at the time of our departure, you know what? I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. He's not saying I fought a good fight. You know, like, yeah, I fought a good fight. I, I, I win. <laughs> no, he's saying I fought the fight that was worth it. 
I fought the fight for people's souls. That's the fight. It's not what I got out of it. It's I was I fought this fight, Lord. There's an enemy out there to rip off people's souls, and he's quite aggressive. And it's a battle. But this this is how he sums up his ministry. I fought the good fight. You and I have battles to contend with. And in First Timothy, at the end of First Timothy chapter six. Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight, lay hold on eternal life to which you are, were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is something visible. You don't hide your Christianity in a closet. You live it. You live it. People are going to resist you. It's normal. But that doesn't stop us from caring for their souls, right? So I, God, give me a greater heart for that. Hebrews chapter 12 uh, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And how do we run? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I often wondered about that phrase who for the joy set before him. What was that? And there's a couple of, couple of explanations. What, you know, I think a primary one was he fulfilled the will of the Father. That was the joy set before him. But I also believe part of that joy was you and me. The joy of you being born again. The joy of you knowing Jesus as your Savior the rejoicing that would come from your life because of that. That's the joy. That's part of the joy that was set before him. And who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He, did, he endured it for you and he endured it for me. And this is, this is part of our warfare, guys. This is part of fighting the good fight. It's a, a prayer is a vital part of our warfare. And he finished the race. He had a goal and he conducted himself in accordance with that goal. I've kept the faith, the body of truth of the Christian faith. And so we have to ask what Jesus has committed to me. Am I keeping that? Have I compromised that? Forgive me, Lord, if I have. And, you know, if you need to ask the Lord for forgiveness on that, do it. Do it. What are you waiting for? <laughs> well, man, I don't know if I'm ready to make that kind of a commitment. Baloney. That's just, a, that's just a diversion tactic. The bottom line is, if you're serious about Jesus, you've got to be serious about Jesus' heart. If you've given your life to him, now let him pour out through your life and let him use you. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Now, this isn't like a king's crown. This is the Stephanos. It was like a victor's wreath made out of, you know, twisted olive branches and leaves and so forth. And you've seen pictures of that, pictures displayed, displayed in the Olympic Games years and years ago. They, would get, they wouldn't get the med, that medal. They'd get a crown. And, of course, the crown would eventually disintegrate. You know, because it's not really about the crown. In fact, if you got an issue with, well, I'm, I can't wait for my crown. Jewels on your crown, man. I used to say that when somebody was sacrificing something. I got, man, you know what? You got more jewels on your crown, man. But, you know, our crowns, when we see the elders in the book of Revelation in heaven, that heavenly scene and the elders kind of representing the church, and it says they see the lamb and they fall down and they cast their crowns before him. They don't, it's not about them. All, anything beautiful that you've done, Lord, it's yours. It's not mine. I don't own that. And I think as we live our lives, that's, that needs to be part of our heart. And he says, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day and not to me only. And I love this, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Are you loving Jesus appearing this morning? I'm loving it that he did appear. 
that he came and he died. But you know what? He's coming again, too. The scripture promises that he will. Over 300 specific promises in scripture about his second coming. And I want to love his appearing today. Because I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. Do you have any guarantee that any of us are going to be here tomorrow? We don't know. And I'm not telling you, be irresponsible, quit your jobs and go put a white robe on and just go out in the streets and preach the gospel. I mean, if God calls you to do that, God bless you. But I'll tell you what, it's a tougher mission field to keep your own clothes on <laughs> and go to work. Amen? You know, and, and, and to, to embrace the, whatever it is that God's given you to take care of your families and still be honoring God and honoring the Lord in the midst of it. That's tougher, I think. It's tougher to, to walk daily, consistently, with the same people. I hate my job. You know, a lot of times people go that, I hate my job. Man, it's your mission field. It's your mission field. God wants to use you there. I'm not saying start preaching in the middle of the workday because your employer is paying you for a certain amount of hours of work. You do the hours of work. That's responsibility. The Lord speaks of that. Many times in the epistles. But I'll tell you, on your own time, oh, let the Lord use you. Let the Lord use you. Anyway, that's, that's another tangent. But loving his appearing, waiting for his appearing. Titus says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to have that mindset, Lord, of Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord. Lord, you promised you were going to come back one day. You told us what the world would probably look like around that time. And that's what we're looking at today. It's a mess. We need Jesus. World peace is not going to come by any particular group taking power and control. It's going to be Jesus himself coming, the righteous judge, who will judge where men's hearts are at. No plea bargaining before that judge. I want my heart to be right when he comes. So I, I, I'm thankful for this text this morning that we could spend some time in it, chew on it. And, and I pray you'd think about these things too, about being poured out, about the Lord being able to take whatever he wants in your life and use it for his purposes and his glory. And whether it be your mind your heart to others, your physical resources, whatever it might be. Let God use it. If there's a need, I mean, sometimes it's so helpful if we approach church in a sense of, Lord, how can I be a blessing? How can I be a help? Just even thinking about that begins to prepare your heart. And then when a need comes, it doesn't annoy you. It's something that, wow, Lord, that was so God. Thank you, like you were, like Kathy was sharing. I mean, you just stand back and you're getting all these hugs and all this love, and you're going, you know, this was just random. <laughs> I didn't plan. I mean, I I prepared my heart, but I didn't plan the family coming. You know, and when you sat down, you may have no idea that Tim chased the guy down over at the food bank. He went after him, said, "Hey, come on, you know, you're welcome." And the guy ends up with his kids, you know, and the blessing just. It just rolled, but, but a couple people had to be obedient, you know? You know, where one guy says, hey, I don't care if I get embarrassed. I'm going to invite the guy to the, to the feast. And somebody else says, well, you know, I have this habit of filling my car with stuff. And, and then the Lord brings the pieces together. And then we share the stories with each other, and we go, yeah, hallelujah, Lord, you're good. Do it, do it again. Do you ever have a little kid, two-year-old, three-year-old, you toss him up in the air, do it again. Do it again, Grandpa. Do it again. Do it again. My back. Do it again. <laughs> and they'll never stop. They're ne they you could be doing that all day long, and they'll keep on saying, do it again. May we be like little kids before the Lord. Jesus said, unless you be converted and become as a little child, you really can't enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, there's a childlikeness to our faith in the Lord. Not childish, but childlike. God help us, amen.
Let's pray together. Why don't we stand? Okay, I know you've been sitting for a bit. Hey, I didn't spill my water. That's good. And I do have the remnant of this wonderful cookie, which is available for the youth ministry outside, so don't forget. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time this morning and the day that's before us. Thank you for Christmas. Uh, Lord, we celebrate your coming every day, Lord. And uh, during this season when the world uh, probably inadvertently turns their attention to you, particularly in the songs, so many of the songs that they sing at the hol- during the holidays, Lord, we pray that you would so quicken our hearts, that we would have such a giving heart uh, for those around us where we're at. Lord, look at, look at our house. Look at our, our, the inside, our house of, of our hearts. And, and, Lord, make yourself at home there. Take and use whatever, whatever is going to be pleasing to you and for the redemption of souls. Use it, Lord. Lord, we pray for one another. We pray you'd bless this church, Lord. God, that this church, this church family would be a light in our community, Lord. God, that we'd see many, many more people come to know you not so much building building a huge church, Lord, but but giving out and letting you build the people you want to build. God, let us be faithful to walk with you this this Christmas, this New Year's. So many different things happening. Lord, might we keep our mind and our heart fixed on you? And as we begin 2016, if you should tarry, may you have your way in our hearts in our lives. We pray this, Lord. We ask this. We beg of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give and and may he be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And just remember when we think of that priestly blessing, that you've been blessed to be a blessing. Now go out into your mission field <laughs> and hang and, and fasten your seatbelts, okay? <laughs> God bless you guys. Have a Merry Christmas. Look forward to seeing you in the new year.